turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11. We think about where we are in the story of Acts. Peter had just been given a vision and a message from Jesus that the gospel wasn't just for the Jews. In the Old Testament, God's primary voice that He used uh, to get His message out was the children of Israel. Right? If you look back in the Old Testament, that was His primary voice uh, from Abraham all the way through. And as we moved into the book of Acts, God changed His primary voice from the children of Israel who rejected Him, right? They nailed Him to a cross. He changed it from that voice to the voice of the church. And right now, we're living in the church age. Where the church is the primary voice to get the gospel to the nation. So here we see Peter is given this vision where uh, this sheet comes down from heaven and it's filled with all kinds of uh, different beasts. We think there's probably some cows and there's some pigs, some ravens and dove. All of the different uh, animals represented. And, and Jesus tells him not to call anything common uh, that Jesus has not made Common. And so here Peter has been given the liberty to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So what does that have to do with me? If the, if the gospel never got to the Gentiles, we would most likely not be sitting in church today. Because the gospel never would have reached America. But because Peter followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, we have the gospel in America today. When the church first started, its primary outreach was... Jews reaching Jews. They uh, had a lot of the same mindsets, but here in Acts chapter number 10 and Acts chapter number 11, the Lord showed Peter that the gospel is for everybody. Isn't that good news this morning? The gospel is for everybody. Here the word is going to get out as well through a man named Barnabas, and he was going to enlist Paul to help him reach this people there in Antioch. This morning we are going to see the gospel continue. We're going to see the reason that Barnabas was sent, and we're going to see the church is not only a gospel-giving church, but uh, just a giving church in general. Let's start in verse number 19 of Acts 11. It says this, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Venice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then Barnabas, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he fa had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Let's pray. Father, God, as we come to your word this morning, we think about this church, the church of Antioch, God, and the, how the gospel continued. And, and here we see the first church that is primarily Gentiles. God, thank you for sending your son to die, not just for the Jews, but for us as well. God, be with us this morning. There's one here that doesn't know you. God, I pray that today they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Bless our time. We just pray. Amen. <clears throat> The first thing we see this morning is the gospel continues. We see that the gospel continued during and after the persecution of Stephen. Remember Stephen back in Acts chapter number 7 was the first martyr and Saul 
who now, uh, he would have a name change, who we know as Paul was there and consented or signed off on his death warrant. Acts chapter number 8, 1 through 4 tells us that the persecution was heightened after the death of Stephen. And because of that, the church was scattered through Judea and Samaria. And while they were scattered, the gospel was still being preached. And so there was some persecution that came to the church. And in Acts 1, 8, 1 through 4 says this, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore they, were, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So here, Paul consents to the death of Stephen, and while uh, they're taking Stephen to be buried, here Paul comes. He wasn't done with Stephen, right? He's wreaking havoc on these new Christians. He's going to their houses, and he's pulling men and women out of their houses and throwing them into prison for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And so what happened was there was a scattering of this first church. They were scattered abroad, but they didn't stop preaching the gospel. They could have easily gone and hid underground, right? But instead, the Bible tells us that they went on preaching the Word. You say, what should we do when persecution comes to us? We should preach the Word. Amen. The scattered believers had made it as far as Venus, Cyprus, and Antioch. Venus was a city that ran about 40 miles along the seacoast. It would have been a great, the great thoroughfare through Phoenicia and Syria, uh, Syria in the north and Egypt and Arabia in the south. This is the way that Philip the Evangelist would have taken on his evangelistic tour. Cyprus was an island off the coast of Syria. It was one of the chief seats of the worship of Venus. And so uh, it was a, a mega center for false worship. And then Antioch was 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And it had a population of around 200 thousand people and was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And so these Christians that were scattered while well, they started in just Judea and Samaria, now they're making it outside of those regions and they're actually reaching the, the Great Commission to its fullest potential. They didn't just stop in Ju Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria. No, they are reaching to the uttermost parts of the world. All of the cities were places that Christians went to escape the persecution that was happening in Jerusalem. I like what one commentator said. He said this, They were scattered abroad, says the Holy Spirit. Satan overreached himself. By scattering the burning coals of Christian witness, he made it possible for fresh fires of uh, fresh fires to spring up elsewhere. And so uh, Satan thought he was defeating the church by persecuting the church. But what he didn't realize is that he was spreading the embers all over the world. And, and soon the, these apostles were going to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Remember what Peter and John said in Acts 4.20. They said this, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They're getting beaten. They're thrown in prison. And, and they tell them, Hey, we're going to let you guys go. But all you have to do is stop talking about this man named Jesus. And what did they say? They said, We can't help it. It is the message that God has laid on our heart. We have seen what Jesus Christ did for us. And we can't stop talking about it. You say, what does it have to do with this? Everywhere the church members went, they found some Jewish people and shared the gospel with them. They couldn't help but speak and teach the things that God had done. The problem with uh, this group of people that had been scattered abroad is that they were, only, they were primarily reaching one group of people. They were going from a Jewish community to Jewish community with the gospel, but they were forgetting about the Gentiles that were all around. Uh, they looked at those Gentiles as outcasts. As the gospel was being spread abroad, some of the men of Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch, and they did something that broke the mold, didn't they? The church, while it was scattered, was still in a box. Uh, this church was, uh, they believed that they were still the primary tool to reach the Jewish people. But what they failed to realize was that they weren't just reaching Jewish people, they should be reaching Gentiles as well. So there's some men from Cyprus and Cyrene that went to Antioch and they spoke to the Grecians. And as, the, as word travels back to the church of Jerusalem, there were some upset people. 
We think about Peter. Peter had just gotten scolded for preaching the gospel to some uh, to the, the the Roman centurion and his family, right? Because he was a Jewish man that had gathered with non-Jews, and that was frowned upon. Peter had unlocked the door for the Gentiles in Caesarea, but here in Antioch, those men pushed the door wide open, and the gospel began to reach the Gentiles. Notice the Bible tells us that the hand of the Lord was with them. When we go and tell others about Jesus, His hand is on us. Right? His hand is on us. He is there and He is helping us. When the hand of the Lord is on our witness, mighty things happen. If we try to go and we try to witness in our own power without the strength of the Holy Spirit behind us, we are powerless Christians. We can try all we want to do it in our own power, but eventually that fire is going to burn out because there's nothing that keeps the fire going. Jesus keeps that fire going to witness to others. Amen. We know that the news would have spread fast. I'm sure some, some of the men had heard about Peter and the Roman centurions. These men from Cyprus and Cyrene had probably heard some stories. They heard how Peter went into a group of Gentiles and shared the gospel and the Holy Spirit fell on them like He did on the day of Pentecost when they were gloriously saved. Think about that, that 120 in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came down and fell on them and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues. And every person understood everything that was going on. What an amazing thought here. Peter, uh, Peter likens what happened there in Caesarea to that experience, therefore bringing the church that was in Jerusalem into the fold. I believe that when they heard this, it brought them to a, uh, a fork in the road. They had to decide whether they were going to stay with the mold that the church had been going for for so long, or were they going to break the mold as Peter did and go to the Gentiles. They might have asked the question like, if Peter can go to the Gentiles, why can't we? Because the hand of the Lord was with them, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. That is the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is this. It turns us from a life following sin to a life following Christ. Amen. We see that there was a great turning of, of, for, for these people. They turned from living a life after their flesh to a living a life after Jesus Christ. Has the gospel changed our life this morning? Has it? The gospel should change our life, right? We were who we who were once dead in trespass and sin are made alive unto Christ. It should change the way that we live. It should change the way that we act. It should change the way we talk. It should change the way we walk. Everything about us should be changed to the power of the gospel. If the gospel has not changed your life, it can. You say, how does the gospel change our life? Number one, you must place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross for you and I. You must place your faith and trust in what Jesus did as He paid the debt for our sins. And then you have to trust that He was buried in that borrowed tomb and that three days later He arose, defeating death, hell, and the grave. The, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There is no salvation in any other thing besides the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Romans 1.16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The, the gospel changed lives. Here we see that the Grecians' lives were changed because of the gospel. They had turned from living a life of sin to living a life after Christ. And we can have that same life change today. We see that the tidings or the news or account of events that happened made its way back to the church at Jerusalem. Think about what a, what a shock it would have been for that church. They had just heard about what Peter did in Caesarea, and now uh, they, they got over that, right? Because Peter told them all the things that had happened. He told them about how he had this dream, and that this other man had a dream, and the Holy Spirit orchestrated this event for them. And, and, and because of the power of the gospel, people were saved, and the Holy Spirit came and fell upon the Gentiles, which was a sign of salvation, right? And so we see that this happened, and so they had gotten over that. But here's the problem. The problem was they never did anything about it. They realized that the gospel was for the Gentiles, but they never actually tried to reach the Gentiles. 
If we truly believe that the gospel is for every man, we should try to reach every man. Right? Amen. Right? We, we should try our very best to reach every man. And can I tell you this morning that we can't do it alone. I cannot reach every man. I can't reach every man in the city of Stephenville. Right? How do we reach people for Christ? Number one, we go. Right? We should be a witness for Jesus Christ in everything that we do. We're going to see Barnabas as a great witness of Christ because of the way that he lived. But here, not only do we have to go, but we have to send others. The reason that our church supports missionaries is so that the gospel gets to the countries we cannot go. Why do we support missionaries in the Philippines? Because we can't go to the Philippines. Why do we support missionaries in Kenya? Because we can't go to Kenya. Here we see that we have, a, we have an obligation to reach the, the world. And what are we doing about it? If we truly want our church to be on mission, we must try our best to reach the world. Amen. We see that he had just, Peter had just come back and they were satisfied with the answer that he gave them about this conversion that happened there in Caesarea. But the church wasn't satisfied with that, so what did they do? They sent Barnabas to Antioch to investigate. Verses 23 through 26 give us the reason that, that Barnabas went. If you remember back to early in our study, we were introduced to Barnabas in Acts chapter number 4 where Barnabas sold a parcel of land that he had and donated that money to the church. So uh, remember in that early church they were giving uh, to the church everything that they had to meet the needs of others. And they eventually gave so much that no one had need of anything. And so Barnabas here had given that parcel of land uh, to the church to further the mission of the church. Here we see him not only is that man who donated to the cause of Christ... Uh, he, he not only gave of his treasures right now, he's going to give of his time. Here we see a man sent from Jerusalem to Antioch. Look what he sees when he gets there. Number one, he sees the grace of God on, their, on that church's life. The Bible tells us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's in 2 Peter 3.18. We should grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If Barnabas walked in the door today and came into our church, would he see the grace of God in our church? Would he see God's grace on our church? Would he see us uh, sharing the grace of God with others? When he sees the grace of God in the church, he exhorts them or he encourages them to keep their eyes on Jesus. I think about what the, the writer of Hebrews put in Hebrews 12 too. He says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You say, how do we keep the grace of God on our church's life? We keep our eyes on him. Yeah. If we want our church to grow in grace, if we want our church to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must keep our focus on him. The next thing we see in the Bible is the description of Barnabas. The first thing that the Bible describes Barnabas as is a good man. Look what Jesus said about a good man in Matthew 12, 35. It says this, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. A good man brings forth good things. Right? So here we see that Barnabas was a good man. Not only was he a good man, but he, 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 was, he had a good name among the community. The Bible tells us that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, right? When people hear our name, they shouldn't go, oh man, not him again. Right? No, they should go, man, that guy's got the grace of God on his life. When people describe us, when they describe us as a good man or a good woman, not only was he a good man, but he was a man full of the Holy Ghost and faith. A man who is full of the Holy Ghost is empty of self. If we want our life to be full of the Holy Ghost, we must empty our life of us. Right? There's not room for the both of us. We must empty our life of every, every uh, carnal want that we have. Spurgeon said this, without the Spirit of God we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind. We are useless. You think about a sailboat. If a sailboat doesn't have wind, what happens? Nothing. Right? 
You need that wind to push the sailboat. And so, uh, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. Barnabas could have easily gone here, and he could have gone to Antioch, but if he didn't have the Spirit of God in his life, the things that happened in Antioch would never have happened. It's not something that he could have orchestrated up. It's not something that he could have used the motion to reach these people. No, the Holy Ghost was there with him, and, and he was he was full of the Holy Ghost. Not only was he full of the Holy Ghost, but he was full of faith. Hebrews eleven six says, "But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Without faith, we cannot please God." Right? It's impossible. We must have faith. Uh, Barnabas had so much faith that he went 300 miles to a place he'd probably never been to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What kind of faith do we have? If we want God to use us, we must be empty of self and full of the Holy Ghost, which will enable us to live a life of faith. If we want to live a faith life, we must live a life that's directed by the Holy Spirit. This was the secret to Barnabas' ministry at Antioch. When Barnabas got to Antioch, the Lord continued to add to his church. Uh, notice, the church probably sent him there to see, like, hey, is this thing in Antioch real? And what happened? When, when Barnabas got there, the Lord continued to add to that church. And here, Barnabas knows, hey, I can't do this on my own anymore. This church is growing too fast. There's too many needs. i got to find somebody to help me. And so what does Barnabas do? Barnabas goes to Tarsus to seek after Saul. So why is that important? What does that have to do with anything in the story? Why were these Christians here in Antioch? Because of the persecution that Paul brought on that church. Right? So here, Barnabas goes, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go get Brother Paul, and we're going to bring him into this church, and we're going to see the Lord continue to use him. The Greek word used uh, for the verb to seek was the same word used to describe Mary and Joseph looking for Jesus after they left him behind. You remember that story where they leave Jesus behind, and they're searching everywhere for him. They go, and they seek him, and, and that same word is what uh, here is used for uh, Barnabas looking for Paul. Paul. Paul probably wouldn't have wanted to be found, right? He would have had to forsake everything that he had ever had, everything that he ever worked for. We think about Paul. Paul was the Jew of Jews, right? He was the, the he was a, a great Pharisee. He was a great Bible teacher or a great law teacher, right? And so he would have had to give up everything. And so here we see that Barnabas finds Paul or Saul, and he brings him back to Antioch to continue the work there. In verse number 26, we find the church celebrating their one year anniversary, where not only were they winning souls to the Lord, but they were teaching them as well. When we think about the Great Commission, I think churches have been really good at going and reaching people. I, I think if we look back to the Great Commission, we've done a really good job at going and trying to reach people. We've done a, a, an okay job at baptizing people. But what have we missed more than anything that the Great Commission has commanded us to do? Teaching people. We're good at reaching. We're good at, we're good at winning. But we are not good at teaching people. This is probably the most neglected part of the Great Commission. Here we find a, a great example of a, a, of a living out of the church's mission, which is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Where the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even to the end of the world. Amen. You know, we're not just called to go. We're not just called to baptize. We're called to teach. What should we teach them? We should teach them the truths of the Word of God. Discipleship is a very important, uh, is a very important aspect of salvation. Right? When we get saved, we shouldn't just get saved, throw them in the baptistry, and just let them go, right? No, we should, they should get saved, they should get baptized, and then we should teach them what the Bible teaches. We must be so careful that we don't miss that portion of the, of the Great Commission. Because you say, why is that so important? 
Think about how many people were saved in the 60s and 70s. And I'm not just picking on that era. There's been plenty of, of times like that where people were saved. And what happened? They got saved, they got baptized, and then what happened? Nothing. Where are they today? Most of them are not in church. Why? Because they weren't taught the truths of Scripture. It's one thing to, to lead someone to Christ, but it's another thing to help them to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what this church was doing. Why did this church continue to grow? Because they were reaching and they were teaching God's disciples. At the end of verse number 26, we see that the disciples earned a new name, which was Christian. Uh, when Christians were first called Christians, it wasn't a term of endearment. Right? It wasn't like, oh, great, you guys are Christians. What a great thing. No. Uh, Christian meant little Christ. It was, a, it was a derogatory term towards them. It meant that they were acting like little Christ, which for us would be a compliment. But they meant it as a derogatory term for these Christians. When people look at us, they should see us acting like Christ. Right? They should see us reflecting Christ. We, as Christians, we have the responsibility to re reflect what Christ has done in us. And so here, we, we see that that is exactly what they were doing. And because of that, they were called Christians. I like what one uh, uh, Spurgeon said this, I believe. He said this, There are some people who need to wear a label around their neck to show that they are Christians at all. Or else we might mistake them for sinners. Their actions are so like those of the ungodly. I pray that none of us need to wear a name tag that says Christian. But that when people see us, they see Christ in us. As believers, we should be like Barnabas and the Christians found in that early church. Because they were acting so much like Jesus, they were called Christians. Then we see the last point this morning is the giving church. This church not only uh, lived out the purpose, which was to share the gospel, to, to get people saved, to baptize them, and to teach them, but they were also giving, uh, a giving church. There's a prophet that came from Jerusalem to Antioch and told them there's going to be a great dearth. That word dearth means famine. There's going to be a time where there was going to be a lack of food throughout the world. And then the Bible tells us, that the famine would be in the days of Claudius Caesar, which ruled from AD 41 to AD 54. And if you go back in the history books, you can read that there were actually famines that went on in this time. And so here we see that, that there was some people in the church had more than others. And so what did they do? And what did the church's response in verses 29 and 30? The, the first thing is the disciples gave what they could to send relief to the brethren that dwelt in Judea. In the midst of the famine, the church at Antioch was still a giving church. And as a church, we should be a giving church. Right? We, we should not only give of our treasures, right? We, we, we have treasures and we should give those. But we should also give of our time and our talents. But can I remind you this morning that that is, that is not the purpose of the church. Right? If all our church ever did was go and build houses for people who are in need or give food to people who are in need or, or, or provide clothing to people who are in need, our church is not a church. Our church is a humanitarian effort, right? If we do all of those things and never share the gospel, we are not living a church on mission. We are, we are providing humanitarian aid to those in need. And we should do that. But that's not the primary purpose of the church. While the church gave what they could, they still were preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they gave everything they could, and it was delivered to the elders in that church by Paul, or by, yeah, by Paul and Barnabas. We should be a giving church. But may I remind you this morning that giving never takes the place of the gospel. That's right? Right? Giving does not take place in the gospel. You can put every penny that you have in your bank account into the offering plate this morning. And that does not take your place for the gospel. You can donate all the amount of money you want to missions. But that does not take your spot for giving the gospel out to others. Giving never takes the place of the gospel. We should be givers, but not just givers of our treasures, but of our time and talents as well. We, if, we have a, if we have a talent, we should use it for the Lord. Right? If we have time, 
We should use it for the Lord. How do we do that? We use it by, by going and telling others about the gospel. In conclusion this morning, in order for the church to stay on mission, we must keep the preaching of the gospel as the priority. The gospel is for every person. Oswald J. Smith said this, Why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone has heard it once? That's a convicting statement. How many times have we heard the gospel? Over and over and over and over, which is a good thing. But why should we get it twice when there are people around the world who have never heard it once? As a church, our goal should be for every man to hear the gospel. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior this morning, today is the day. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and three days later he rose again to pay the sin debt of the world. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to <coughs> repentance. Will you trust him today? Believers, how, you, how is your walk with the Lord? Can people tell by the way that you live that you're a Christian? It is impossible to live that life in our own strength. We must live that life by being filled with the Holy Spirit as Barnabas was. Let's all stand. We'll have a verse of invitation. <coughs> 119, not 319. 119 after we pray. Father God, thank you this morning for your word. And I pray that you bless the invitation now. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, pray this morning they come and get it settled before they leave the building. Bless the invitation. I just say pray. Amen.